and I got to put this somewhere in in the thing. But, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Marshall Mack. I'm talking with uh, my friend Lou Tobacken. Uh, I consider one of the greatest saxophone players that I that I know, and we met somewhere in Japan at the Pit Inn, actually in person for the first time. I think about five years ago or something like that. I think I think we I think we met, if I'm not mistaken, at Ishimori's. Oh, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. First time you were fooling around with some tenors and you were trying to figure something out, uh, which one to keep or whatever. You were going through some changes. I think we met there. Oh, and... that's right. I, I was considering selling one of my prized tenors. And then you, and you yeah. said, let, let me see that thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I remember, now I forgot. And then you played it. And it sounded so good. And then you said to me, man, you don't want to get rid of this one, man. This is a keeper. Yeah, so whatever it is, sometimes <laughs> you, need, you need some input, you know, from other people. <laughs> man, I, I ended up did keeping it, and I'm so glad. You know, it, it was a 141,000 tenor. When I got it, it was a, came from one person. They bought it for their son, left it in Connecticut. Uh, Bill Singer did the overhaul some years ago, and... It's a much different sound than the other tenor I wanted to buy at the time. I ended up able to kind of purchase both of them. They're, they're much different. One's 86,000, one's 141,000. As you said, much different tenors, you know. Yeah, there's a different, the, the design was different. And it kept on evolving, it kept on evolving. 80,000s are different than the, the later ones. And I don't know, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, but you can't always go by the numbers and all that stuff. I'm playing the 50,000 now. Balance action? Yes, it was a late balance. Wow. It would be for the six. I got used to it. Um, it's got a little bit smaller bore. That's right. So if people say you kind of get around faster on those, what do, you, what do you think? I don't think, I don't really care about that. It's not my thing. So, I mean, I never, it, you know, <laughs> you get used to it and, you know, but it's a sad, it's the, uh, sound and the impact it was the response put it that way that I, I liked about it and i got used to it and my repair my technician uh uh tomoji you know hirakata hirakata yes i, I know tomoji well yeah, anyway he uh it's it's his especially his horn when i got it it was like a really bad condition so i at that time, he had his own shop, and I gave it to him. I said, Tomoji, this is your horn. <laughs> Whatever. I mean, I, I couldn't even play it. I, pl I played a couple notes on it, and I said, I think it's going to be a good horn. And I gave it to him, and he straightened it out, and gold-plated it, huh. did some engraving. And then a few years later, I started playing it. And, uh, and as Lester Young would say, the bitch is mine, you know? <laughs> Right. So you still have that horn, of course, right? Oh, that's what I play. I have a couple sixes, but I play this one. Oh, I see. So uh, one one day I said to you, and I, I wanted to. I usually don't like to play music because then then YouTube YouTube finds the music and tells me it's copyrighted and stuff. But um, I, I wanted to play one thing. Give me a second to see if I can get it up here for you. Thank you. 
that's that's out of the past. It was killing, brother. And and, and what well, I mentioned to you once that I felt that you, I mentioned that you were a brand, Lou Tobacco and, and your wife, uh, Toshiko. And what I, meant by, what I meant by that was, see, we're coming up, I graduated high school 1977. And as you know, in high schools and junior high schools, the stage bands were a big thing at the time. So there were certain printed music that we had. And of course, a lot of it was Toshiko's, Thad Jones, Count Basie, Sam Manestico, Buddy Rich. You know, you know the repertoire that they play in high school. So that's what I meant, actually. That's how I first got introduced to you at that age was Lutabak and Toshiko Big Band, you know, because it's high school and college. And and that's a that's a slamming band, man. Can, can you, I think Frank West was in it. Can you tell me about that, that, that band, that gig, that time period? Is that 1976? When is that? Well, that was that was a pre Frank West. That was a California band. Huh. We started the band around seventy three, and uh, out of actually it was out of boredom. So I moved. We moved to uh, Los Angeles in seventy two for various reasons. I was offered some work. Uh, Doc Severinsen offered me some work uh, on the Tonight Show and stuff and the scene the scene in new york was got really weird I, I mean i hate to say this but i was became a victim of the black revolution in a sense well i was supportive of the black revolution but it wasn't good for white people so i was my opportunity started to get less and less uh duke pearson tried to get me a record contract and there was no they weren't recording white musicians at that time and thing got a little strange a friend of mine uh i don't know if you know john b williams bass player i he, uh, i definitely know who he is i probably yeah, met him somewhere he, along he was my friend and he we played together with doc severance and stuff and he he moved to los angeles he says man come on out here man it's like it's great i'm working all the time and so i said okay so we uh, we moved to Los Angeles, and shortly after moving there, I realized I was like a like a, in the wrong place. I was kind of like a fish out of water. Was that the expression? <laughs> I mean, it was like I didn't relate too well. Uh, when I got up on the stand to play with those guys, it felt like it was another band. So, and and a lot a lot of guys asked me to play with their bands. You know, and but most of the music that they wrote was auditioning for uh, utility work, like you know, uh, movies and whatever. So I told you know, Tosco had some charts. I said, well, Tosco, why don't you? I'll call some guys and we'll we'll rehearse some of your music just for fun. And so that was the beginning. One thing led to another, and she started to write more music, and we found appropriate players and that's how the band started so that started in around 73 and that was that was the beginning uh the band uh we moved back to new york in 82 that's when frank west joined the band he uh so we had to you know we had to develop a whole new band and we were so fortunate to have him because he was so great he established the whole saxophone reality you know which was quite interesting and anyway so but what you were you were listening to was i think it was the la band hello i'm losing you it sounds great who was playing lead out the one there you oh boy uh at that time the original, the original LA band, uh, Dick Spencer was playing lead alto. I don't know if you know who he is. No. He passed away uh, not too long ago. Uh, he was the original lead alto player. We had a, we had a, we had some good guys, man. Oh, we, you know, L the LA guys. Um, we rehearse every Wednesday morning at the union because you could rehearse at the union for 50 cents and i mean 50 cents <laughs> for almost three hours and we rehearse and a lot of like studio guys would come in 
and they couldn't sight read the music, so they get really pissed off, you know. And it was like if it was like if you couldn't play it the first time, it's kind of like a Count Basie thing. If if you if the band didn't, you know, do it the first time, it was canceled it. Uh, so these guys would be dropping out, you know, like they were challenged and they said, Wow, this music's too hard. It's kind of like one body said it was avant-garde bebop, or whatever it was. So we eventually developed a band, and it was went through a lot of trials and errors, and eventually it, it became. We started to get some gigs, and we went on the road, and it became a band. Huh. It, it it sounds great, man. There was there was a lot of great players in Los Angeles, and still are, but. Uh... I remember there was the big recording scene, you know, Jackie Kelso and Plas Johnson, all those cats and stuff, right? What's that? Uh, Jackie, Jackie Kelso. I'm, I'm still working on my sound over here because I, I oh, changed okay. the setting. I'm not sure. Is it is it okay now? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, well, they they weren't in the band. Those guys were not in the band. They were like studio guys. So. Yeah, we had, you know, we had, uh, well, the original sax section was, uh, uh, Dick Spencer, first alto, Gary Foster, um, actually Bill Perkins played baritone, huh. and uh, Tom Peterson was the uh, fourth tenor. I, I, I'm in the old school, first first alto, second tenor, third alto, fourth tenor. That's um, I'm you know I grew up with that. You know? I do too. <laughs> <laughs> now it's now it's like for they don't like to say fourth tenor they say second tenor like it's demeaning to be fourth fourth tenor is the hardest chair in the sax section yeah for the parts it's, of it's the most it could be the most rewarding if you really take it seriously but anyway that was the original saxophone section right that that's the way i remember growing up and when you get to the basie band book that's the way it was it was you know yeah, for, sure it was like that, that. that you know that's, that's, and, that, and that has that has to do with the voicings correct yeah of course yeah. Uh, or you're the fourth voice you know right i don't know why they changed it it's kind of weird it's, <laughs> a stigma. it's a stigma of being fourth you know or fifth <laughs> fifth saxophone you have to be first second or first second uh, what is it third or whatever anyway it is what it is <laughs> it's not important do you remember who was playing the trumpet solo on that track it's probably a long time ago i didn't get any well, i don't know which which recording that was we recorded a few times it might have been uh, bobby shoe or i don't know uh oh bobby shoe could have been bobby shoe uh, i i don't know which which recording that was i don't remember it was a long time ago well, that, that, that it's a great recording. I know you did other versions. There's a video. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember in New York, I, I, you guys played, you had a regular gig somewhere because I, I knew Mike Pinella and Scott Robinson and all okay. those guys. We, we, we played every Monday night at Birdland. Was that it, Birdland? It was Birdland for 10 years. Before that, we had Monday nights. We were like the, the Monday night tradition. We had we played at, at Blue Note for a while. We played at Lush Life. It was a club called Lush Life, really small, and Birdland. And we also actually did one at the uh, top of the gate. So we, you know, we we were like a Monday night, a Monday night band. The longest association was Birdland. Right. That was a band with Mike Pinello and those guys. Yeah, Mike, Mike, Mike and I were playing in the United Nations Orchestra and, and with Paquito. And okay. sometimes he actually missed some gigs. I think he had some work with you guys or other people. But uh, I, I never got to sub in that band. But it, it, it was a brilliant band. Man, it was really, you know. Yeah. So we always looked at when I when I was coming up. You know, when you're young, I'm I'm a little younger than you, I think. And, uh, and when in high school, Toshiko and Thad parts were the hardest for us high school players. You know, <laughs> you know to play the sax solely. You know. Sammy Nestico charts were just kind of, you know, simplified down. Well, you know, when I grew up, we didn't have anything like that. We didn't have, finally in high school, we had one substitute, uh, we had one band director decided to try to do a little, have a, organize a little band. And we played 
I think we played like really simple charts. Glenn Osser, does that ring a bell? I mean, these charts are really easy, huh. but they were, they sounded good and they're easy to play, but uh, it was very, it was a new thing. We, I, I went to a high school, actually I graduated in 58. So there was nothing much, you know, as, as far as organized school, quote unquote, jazz band or stage band activities. So that was, we were on our own, basically. That That's true. If I remember, I think the stage band started sometime around in the 70s when I was, yeah. you you were graduated high school in 1958. I was born in 1959, brother. Right. <laughs> Something like that. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I wanted I wanted to ask you I I really enjoy your tenor playing and it seems to be rooted in uh I'm just guessing now it seems to be rooted a lot to me in Coleman Hawkins Ben Webster Sonny Stitt coming out of that driving style you have the growls the big fat sound you know things have changed now can you tell me a little bit about how you learned to play who were your influence and how, how did you know it? my it's, I, I can i remember i started to play when i was 15 and in philadelphia uh there, there was a amongst the white saxophone players the hero was al cohen hmm. all the guys you know, idolized him so I started to, you know, I'd run into Frank Tabiri, who was really an Al Cohn guy in those days, pre cult before his Coltrane reality. Right. And he said, oh, and I couldn't afford many records. So he said, try to get this record. So I listened to it. And so when I first started to play, I never forgot my first attempt at playing the tenor saxophone. I had a Con 10M, a Brillhart number four rubber, hard rubber mouthpiece and a symmetric cut reed. I don't know if you remember those. It's probably before your time. And I knew exactly the sound I wanted to get. And I worked at it. And about four hours later, I had a sound that was approximated what I heard in my head, which is, which is a good lesson. Like a lot of young players, they start out, they have no idea what they want to sound like so they can practice eight hours a day and they can't quite figure out what they're trying to do. But anyway, I got into that and then I did, and then all of a sudden I started to hear Sonny Rollins and Coltrane. For a while I was a Coltrane clone, believe it or not. Yeah. I could I could actually approximate sound and I so I get on the bandstand and <laughs> Try to be somebody I wasn't, you know, when I said, well, there's something wrong with this picture, you know, here I'm, you know, like coming from a different background and, you know, trying to play like train. I mean, I mean, it was like early train. So, and then I would hear a lot of guys, hear a lot of white tenor players trying to play like that. I said, they sound terrible, man. I said, maybe I sound just as bad, but I don't think I did. I, I think I was doing okay, but I realized that there's something wrong with the whole, my whole approach. So there was a older, older than me, older guy, trombone player who had a record collection, invited me to his place and he played me all the classic tenor players. I never heard all the great players. He, he played Lester Young. I mean, like Lester Young is perfection. I mean, you hear Lester Young and it's like, wow. And you know, there's nothing, you wouldn't change a note. Play Ben Webster. I never heard anything like that. Don Bias. I mean, I never heard anybody play the tenor like, you know, like, you know, like that. I mean, he was the master of the tenor. I played all these guys and got the Coleman Hawkins and it was too hard for me. Can you imagine going from Coltrane to Coleman Hawkins and Hawkins was, you know, the sound concept, time, and the harmonically, and it was so complicated. I mean, Hawkins was incredibly difficult. I mean, in a way, maybe more difficult than Bird. And so, anyway, I listened to all this stuff, and, and I started to do some investigation. I heard Chew Berry, and I said, man, that's, that's special, too. And then 
eventually the light bulb went off years later and Hawkins kind of said, well, that's, I really was, I was too young to appreciate it. All of a sudden I realized the greatness of Hawkins and he, and he was like basically the root of the whole thing. Now he was, he was the source, put it that way. So I listened to all these players and I tried to absorb certain essence from, from these players not necessarily transcribing stuff, but trying to get the spirit. Like you listen to Lester and there's a certain buoyancy that you hear. You listen to Ben Wester's Tosco has a great description. She calls it tragic beauty. Huh. You know, Ben Wester is so dark, man. Like, you know, it was, it's a deep world. I can tell you a story about my involvement with that. But uh, anyway, I, I, I try to absorb certain elements of all these players and then when i heard sonny rollins who was you know a hero of mine and i could hear all of a sudden i could hear all those elements coming out of his horn the revelation was that if you take all these influences and you put them in a pot you know and you mix it up and eventually you find you know your own thing comes out of it i mean you can always hear influences but basically you find your own voice. Pepper Adams had a, a line. He said, if you, uh, if you copy one or two players, it's plagiarism. If you copy a lot of people, it's called research. So it was like, it was, you know, so that's how things started, you know, percolating. How did this, and, and eventually, when I hit 40 years old, I remember playing in Nice, jazz festival out, and Jimmy Heath came over to me and said man like something happened man your sound is so you know it's changed and you're playing so much you know you're really playing great blah 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 and he said but you're 40 years old and I started to think about it and I think when you, you hit around 40 I mean it's just this is a generalization of course when you hit around 40 you find your you, you begin to accept your idiosyncrasy. Even before you try to get rid of it, you don't want to. You, you kind of what you do kind of is annoying because it's not. It doesn't sound exactly like all the people that you you like. But you learn to accept your idiosyncrasy, and then you can begin to develop. You know your solidify your own approach, right. so you're not just. Uh, a copy, you know, and I, as years, many years later, not many years later, but when I was around, I was in New York, I guess I was around late 20, 27, whatever. I was hanging out with, uh, I, I, I went to hear Zoot Sims and he came off the bandstand and he, he said, you know, man, it's the first time in my life I feel confident about my playing, you know, and I'm thinking, it's just Zoot Sims, man. I mean, he, he always sounded great, you know, and I couldn't believe it. He, first, that he confided in me, some young, you know, nobody, he, you know, he, he confided in me. And then years later, I realized that he was probably at that time around 40. And he, he began to feel comfortable in his own skin, you know, he's, which, you know, to an outsider, it seemed ridiculous because he sounded great for so many years. But in, in his mind, he, he found like he finally felt like he arrived. So there's a whole evolution that takes place, you know, in, in, in most people. That makes sense. Uh, and, then, and then we have some, some, uh, some of the cats come along and only live 35 years, 38 years, a certain amount that's, of time. That's, you know, I mean, like... I mean, like, when you, like, when you I mean, look at it this way, in the old days, people played, like, they played all the time. They played, like, every night, in clubs, and concerts, you know, so your, develop, your development is quicker. So by the time you're 30, 20, late 20s, you're, you know, you're on your way. But in, in, in the later years, you don't have that kind of reality. It takes much longer. It's, it's a slower, slower process. I mean, and, you know, you can look at 
bird, you know, and but that's the exception. That's not the standard reality, you know. And that, that's exactly what Frank West told me, actually, when we, I, I, you know, I used to talk with West about stuff. And, and he said, you know, uh, back then, you know, we were playing all of the time. You know, he said the Basie Band had 300 dates. He said, I was playing all day, playing all night. He actually said, you know, you, you guys will never be able to play like we did. It won't happen again. And I, I, you know, I got to speak with Plas Johnson. He said what you said. He said, we played. I said, how did you learn to play the way you did? He said, we, I played jazz seven nights a week. I played at home with records during the day. He said it was 24 hours of playing music, you know. Yeah, I mean, it was a different, it was a different reality. And uh, so we have to look at it in a different way. So it takes us, it takes some of us longer. Like I'm, you know, I always consider myself a work in progress and like even, even in my geriatric reality. So I, I'm still thinking the same way, you know, like trying to get it right. And it's, it's an interesting, you know, interesting situation. So uh, what else, what else are you going to do? And, you know, but I, I really enjoy that solo that, that uh, on the on the rhythm changes there that you played there, man. I, I, I it I, has lots of energy. Well, that was a funny. I used to have to start out that this this particular tune. Now that I think about it, it's A flat, A flat. I've got rhythm. Okay, now we do it. We do it. We go on tour like wherever I have to play it. Right. I say to the the guy next to me, the alto player, third alto player. I said, okay, what note should I start on? <laughs> you start out playing like, it's not that like you're playing a cadenza before you start, like, you know, you're, you're starting right on, right on one or whatever. Right. And so I said, give me a note. Now, of course, you give me the most ridiculous note to start on, like an A or something. It's okay. It's like, because you have to choose the first note. The hardest thing to do is to choose the first note. Right. So I, I let him I let him choose the first note and deal with it. So uh, it's an interesting when you're put in that position, you can you can I mean, you could. We had guys and I hate to say this, we had guys coming through our band that would play the same solo every night, you know, young guys, you know, I said, why, why they do that, you know. So you could do that, you could play the same solo all the time, it would become a part of the chart, like, you know, like that we know in history, like, you know, Duke span it. But I used to, I welcome the challenge, you know, right. somehow. It's the same thing in the Basie band. I remember, the, you know, John Williams, the baritone player, used to say that. He said, you know, over over my 40 years in the band, we have some guys, they played the same solo every night. And you, yeah, have, right. you have other guys that come up, it's always something different. But he said, that's just part of the music. And I do agree, when, when you're touring with the band a lot and it's playing a lot, the solo becomes part of the chart if the guy sticks to the similar yeah, solo. It can, become part of it. it can become part of the chart. There's certain things that, right. you know, yeah, I mean... But in, in in this band, our band, it was it was a combination of a big band and a small group. Hmm. So there's a big band, you know, the ensemble. But when the guy got up to play a solo, all of a sudden it's a small group. So everything had to change. And it drove one one of our actually our first permanent drummer it drove him nuts in the beginning. He says, "I can't do it, man. I, I've got to play the ensemble." And then I got all these horn players. And they all play different, and I have to play company them. He'd be like Brit Woman was in the band in the beginning. I had to play with Brit. I've got to play with you. I've got to play with this guy. I said, "Oh, it's cool, man. Just relax." And finally, uh, you know, we had a pif an epiphany. Is that the right word? And everything worked out. But it was like the concept of the band was to be a, a big band. But when a guy got up to play a solo, it was a small group forget about the big band. So that was the concept. That's cool. So you couldn't, you know, although there were a couple guys that still managed to play the same solo. And I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. But and the young guys too, you know, why, why would you want to do that? Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting though. They didn't last too long. <laughs> although that, some of them did, some of them went on to become really very successful studio guys. Oh. So I guess that's, that's cool. You know, Right. Hey, man. It's a, 
the, the, the business was changing a lot by, by the seventies, things were changing. And then the eighties, things were changing even more. And I, I, well, they're, always, they're always changing, you know, like, you know, it's, it's constant, you know, constant change. And, you know, I don't know what future holds, but I remember coming to New York at the end of the, when there was still a studio scene, you know, guys played in, this, that's how I used to be like, <laughs> I used to be uh, Joe Farrell's sub. Hmm. So I, when I came to New York, I, I played with Elvin one night. I sat in with Elvin. And he, so he started sending me in to play with Elvin when he couldn't do it. And then he sent me in the Thad Jones band. And, and uh, you know, all that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. in Because he was busy doing studio work. Anyway, there'd be like, you go to see Thad Jones and Mel Lewis in the course of a set, the course of an evening, the trumpet section would change, this guy moves, comes in, this guy goes out, you know, they're all coming from dates and whatever. It was a, diff it was a different world. Saxophone repairman, it was a saxophone repairman, his name was Nick Engelman. Guys would come in between dates. Oh, my this pad is leaking, this is, and he would, he would get guys, you know, he would have their horn able, you know, ready for the next gig. There was no, uh, uh, that was his function to keep guys active. So there was a studio scene. So that died and things changed and oh, they're always changing. Yeah. Well, sometimes not for the better. Now you, you got oh, me, yeah. interested. you got me interested <laughs> now because sometimes you got me interested. Talk about that. Right, not, not a lot of people I've talked to uh, 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 knew Joe Farrell, at least in the crowd that I hung with, and, and I, I and he was one of the cats I was listening to in, back in high school because he was on a lot of, as you mentioned, a lot of records, you know. So, yeah. can, can you tell me what, how well you knew Joe? What was he like? Uh, you know, well, he was a weird guy. I mean, he was for some <laughs> reason, for some reason he liked me, and like, uh, but he he didn't talk to people. He was kind of a I don't, know, I don't know. He was a not a sociable guy, and like, so we we hang out. Like, I always have my horn, you know. I always have my leather bag, you know, over my shoulder in those days. Hmm. So I'd be hanging out. We'd be hanging out. And he said, "Oh man, go play with this guy. Why don't you go play with him?" So you know, I go up and play. I so I'm playing, and I look around. And Sonny Rollins is in the club. I said, "Oh, I know he set me up for this." You know, <laughs> You know, we used to hang out. He was, you know, he, he was, he, you know, we had a nice relationship in a way. He liked, you know, you know, my he was a flute major, and he liked my flute playing, and right. so we, we we were cool, and you know, he, he was he was nice to me. I remember. <laughs> I remember one time I had a little group. We're trying to do a gig in outdoors, and we we needed a couple drums. So he said, "Oh, Elvin's got all his drums in my house. You can. I'm, I don't think you would mind if you took them. You know, we take borrow Elvin's drums to, <laughs> to do a little bar gig." <laughs> wow. <laughs> Elvin was Elvin was really a nice. He was really a nice guy. He he was he was beautiful. I, I, I met El. I, I got to meet a lot of people being in a younger crowd and I didn't up, end up doing a lot of small group gigs. I became like the big band guy, you know, but I look, I'm happy to have worked with the people I've worked the way the industry was going. I, I, I do remember meeting Elva once at the Lionel Hampton Jazz Festival. That was, my, that was you know, and, and I was playing with Lionel's band a long time and I'm still in the band is today. But, uh, I know the other cats always talk about this, Cleve Guyton and cats. So Elvin was at the festival and Hampton always had people sit in where, where, you know, where people come and play with the band. So he was going to have Elvin play and he came up, he's going to play Hamp's Boogie Woogie. Now, you you know, we're kind of, a lot of us are, you know, younger cats. So Cleve and I were thinking, damn, Elvin, what's he going to do? What's he going to, you know, I mean, what's this going to be like with me, with Lionel Hampton? Elvin laid down the fattest, biggest old fat back groove on Hamp's Boogie Woogie that we ever heard. You know, you know, Hamp's like, ah, come on, here we go. Ah, 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 ah. And Elvin just popped a groove on there, man. The stage was shaking. And I felt I was swinging so hard, I thought I'd fall off the stage. That and a couple times with, uh, uh, with uh, you know, 
Dad and Mel's band. But one time we played a gig and you know, boy, it was a different world, man. Like now Elvin, Elvin was, uh, you know, we think I've, I've been thinking, you know, I'm not a big band. I, my background is not a big band background. Uh, I never played in a big band until I came to New York, you know, and, and I got a call. I hadn't been in New York very long. I got a call to join. Check this out. He's talking about Lionel, Lionel Hampton. This was Cab Calloway reunion band. Hmm. Now, now think about that. <laughs> I show up and and I forgot what, 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 where it was in New Jersey, wherever it was. And I see all these guys and there's all these old black guys, you know, and I thought they were really old at the time. Now I don't think they were that old, but... <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, why am I here? You know, like what am I here for? And like I thought it was a joke. Right. And like I mean, just think about the Cab Cattle reunion band. It's like 1930s, and and it was like one of our great experiences because the sax section was uh, Eddie Barefield. I you know him of him, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. George Dorsey was a lead alto player. Uh, Sam the Man Taylor, you know, <laughs> King of Japan, and uh, baritone player was guy Garvin Bouchel, who played oboe on the Puerto Rico Symphony. Or <laughs> I mean, all these guys, and and it was I never played I never played in that kind of situation and playing like. When Lionel, I mean, on him, Cap Calibre was kind of a jerk. You know, he was kind of a. I don't want to curse on 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 your program, but he was he was not a nice guy. He was a, kind of mean. And like, but when he we play we play a, like a, a uh, some place, and then like the last set, he would split, and Bearfield would pull out of these old charts. He had like Buster Harding charts and. Right. He had charts from, you know, so many, you know, great writers and we played them and played these, Buster Harding wrote these sax solis and it was kind of fortunate. I didn't read that great. So, which was good because if I was academic, I would have had a problem because like the lead alto player would just play the way, or it was his solo. He played like, you know, it was his thing. We'd have to follow him. So I, I learned to develop uh, communication. This kind of, uh, I'm sure you've experienced it, where you kind of like, you tune in to the guys playing, and you, and you, you match the phraseology. And it was like, I mean, that that was the way bands used to be. That was real big band music, where uh, it was a living thing. It wasn't an academic thing. It was like. You didn't have to explain the eighth notes, you know. Nowadays, you have to explain the eighth notes. You just write a fucking eighth note, you know. And I, now the guys, you know, I had a guy. It was a guy in the band. It was our band that was a little bit puzzled by Frank West. Right. He's not playing it the way it's written. I said, "Well, why? He's not supposed to play it the way it's written. It's just a guide. You're supposed to." But once he, once he decided on how to play it he played it the same way all the time so that was the beauty march royal i played a couple times with him he changed stuff a little bit you know he didn't always play it exactly the same but frank frank played it like and once he decided okay this is how it's going to be that was how it was so whether you know uh it was exactly it's not supposed to be exactly the way it's written now everything has to be exactly the way it's written so that's another but but my uh, Cab Calvary reunion band was was a great experience. For whatever reason, I was put in that situation. I became very close to uh, a lot of a lot of guys, and uh, Eddie Barefield became like really important to me. And then when got off the road we moved into the riverboat sam sam taylor left and then i became i got all the solos which was cool and then i learned about uh chewberry and it was like you know it was, a, it was a, as far as big band 
situation, it was a really great learning learning experience for me because it was anti-academic. It was just music. You know, I agree about the section playing, and that, and that was something I was good at. I think that's why Frank Foster hired me to play as a sub the first time in 95. You know, I was very good at locking in. I, I don't know where I developed, but maybe from that, I had classical clarinet training. You just learn to listen and learn how to play in the section, and so many people can't do that. You're absolutely right. And, and uh, you know, when I would just lock into the the lead alto and the other players. And for instance, when I got hired full time to play second alto beside Jackie Kelso, you know, he often complimented me. And, and someone actually recorded the sax sections. He had a sound and they came back to me and said, man, you, you're like the only one who's really locked right in the Jackie because he used to say, you're right with, you know, Jackie was very erudite. I don't know if you met Jackie Kelso. You are right with me, Marshall, exactly in the manner that I am playing. And I appreciate that, sir. You know, he was, he was... Well, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a lost art. And uh, I, like I said, I had no, I had very little big band experience. And I was playing, actually, I was playing in a band that Al Cohen was leading. He took over his band. Uh, Willis Conover had this, I don't know how he it transpired, but he had this band and or, or, I, don't, I don't know how he, but... Al Cohen, who was my original hero, you know, was leading the band, and I'm sitting there playing low tenor. I call, you know, fourth tenor. I'm sitting next to this baritone player, who was an experienced guy. I can't think of his name right away. And he said, "Man, he said you play, you play your part like you really, it's real music, you know, and I, you know, you you really play it like it's you know, even though it's a lower part, it's not a melody, <laughs> like you." And I said, well, I realized that that's what I do. And and uh, my other big band experience was I used to hang out at Jim and Andy's a famous musician's bar. And I'm there one night and Sue Sims, is, he's, he's, he's having a lot of fun. He said, hey, man, Clark Terry's, uh, Clark's rehearsing this band. And I don't feel like making it. Why don't you go? Why don't you do it? So I go. I play there. It was it was Clark Terry's All Star Band. Uh, sax section was Frank West, uh, Phil Woods was lead alto, Danny Bank and baritone player, and uh, another alto player. I think his name was Billy Donovan or something. Anyway, so every week I I would show up at the same place. And Jim and Andy, same time, same place. Zoot was sent. He said, "Hey man, why don't you do the rehearsal?" So it kept on happening. So after about four or five rehearsals, Phil Wood said, "I don't think Zoot wants to do this, man. You, you know, you've been rehearsing, so you should do. You may as well do the gig." And so I was the only non All Star in Clark Terry's All Star Band, <laughs> which was interesting. Now that I think about it, it was it was an important experience because I, I didn't I got to play a solo and it was like I don't know what I was trying to do. I was kind of like I didn't know what I was trying to do. I was kind of imposing myself on the music, and it was like come out of insecurity or whatever it is, and it, whatever I was doing was not right. You know, it didn't work. All right. I started to think about it. I said, man, like this is not happening. And so I decided that I'm going to let Clark be, I'm going to grow out of Clark. I'm going to grow out of his feeling. And when I play, I'm going to, I'm going to use that as a, at least as a point of departure. So I grow out of, it's like more like a Zen reality. And it, it, it really was, it really became very important. When I realized that, it really helped me. I mean, years later, I, I heard a, I went to a gig in New York, and there's a, a tenor player who's actually pre, kind of prominent guy now. <laughs> he was playing with this group, and they were playing very straight ahead music, and he get up to play, and he just it made no sense what he was doing. So after I, since I was older than him, I said, look, man, you can't do that. You can't, I know from experience, you can't impose yourself on the situation. You know, if you're doing, 
you have to grow out of this feeling and the spirit of the music. You know, at least you start out that way, maybe by a few courses, maybe you can take it someplace. It's a little different, but you can't just say, oh, here I am, man, take it or leave it. This is what I do. You know, it's not the way music is. And I used to get like, I used to go from through my career, if you want to call it a career, I, I don't like that word, but I'd be playing like, I'd be playing in Nice, I'd be playing with Freddie Hubbard. And then, you know how they put you with different groups, all of a sudden they put me with George Wayne's Newport All-Stars. Right. right. Like, uh, it was like, uh, actually one of the thrill, thrills was, uh, Slam Stewart was in the band, who was a hero of mine, Ever since I heard him do the, you know, Don Bias stuff, of course, you know, the duets. And like, you know, Scott Hamilton and Warren Bache and those guys, Oliver Jackson. And they're playing this stuff, you know, they play it all the time. So they're bored with this shit, you know. And I never, I, I heard this music, but I never really played it much. So I'm playing and like, I'm having a good time. And, and. I had no problem going from uh, Freddie Hubbard to uh, George Wayne, you know? <laughs> and I get off the bandstand and all these English guys, British jazz journal guys, we didn't know you could play like that. We thought you were having guard player. He said, so all of a sudden I became a hero of the, of the mainstream world <laughs> in Britain, whatever that means. The point, the point being is, and if you've heard and if you listen to enough music and you absorbed enough music, it's, it's like it's natural to play in different situations that feel a little different. You don't have to do anything radical to, you know, you just, you just, just come and come like, and again, it's like a Zen reality. Right. I was, a friend of mine just called me today, uh, John Eckert. I don't know if he's a puppet how, player. How is John Eckert? Hmm? How is he doing? Oh, he's doing fine. He's talking about playing, doing some playing. Anyway, he said, you see, I've been playing with Bird. You know, he's been playing with Charlie Parker records. Telling me, see him. But Bird, you know, you know, he, he's so great, but he, he also, he swings. He really swings. You know, like a lot of bebop guys don't really swing. And. <laughs> It's, it's an interesting observation because right. I've, exper I've experienced that because I'd be with doing stuff like, you know, in that George Wayne kind of world. And then some bebop guys come in and they can't, they can't make the adjustment where Bird could just play. He, he transcended, he transcended style. He just like, he just, whatever he did fit. And it was, he, because he was, he, it was a special thing. It's, it's a very interesting reality when you think about it, situations like that. And, it, and then it even got even more dramatic, you know, post-Coltrane, Coltrane and post-Coltrane. Uh, most of those guys, if you put them in a straight ahead, you know, ching chick -a ching world, it's, they're lost. And it's like, you know, because it's, it's not an intellectual experience anymore. It's, it's, it has to do more with, you know, uh, swing, if it's an old word, or and feeling and communication. It's a, it's a different kind of a, different approach.